and we talked all off season, 52%, 52%, 52%. Week one, 77%. Now, I... Hey, Eagles fans, if you're a subscriber to the Jacob Media YouTube channel, you are already registered to win a pair of season tickets for the upcoming season. That's right. You could win a pair of season tickets for the upcoming 2021 season just for being a subscriber. If you're watching and you're not a subscriber, do it now. Subscribe to the Jacob Media YouTube channel right now. What do you need to do? Subscribe right now. First for us today. A Birds 365 after an Eagle win, seeing as they went 0-2-1 in preseason, and this game matters that much more. It's good to be on with all you Eagle fans. This is Birds 365. I got Jeff Kerr as my co-host today, because John McMullen has not left Hot Atlanta yet. He'll be flying back to Philadelphia today, but he joins us to start the show as a guest. That wasn't a bad debut for Nick Sirianni at all, was it, Mr. McMullen? No, man. I, I don't know how it could have went better. That was my first question to Nick Sirianni. Unless you're expecting perfection, um, which is never going to happen in the NFL. I mean, literally, it couldn't have went better. It really couldn't. You really got to nitpick to find problems. The, uh, the run support on defense early was an issue, but that got fixed pretty quickly. Too many penalties, but I mean, that's the NFL early in the season. Um I think there were five on the offensive line in the in the first half, but again, you got you really got to nitpick to find anything negative in this game. And you know, I I think we can officially uh, uh, put the toe tag on the preseason. It is absolutely meaningless. Absolutely meaningless. John, I, I know before I went on the post post game show last night, you gave the game ball to Jalen Hurts. I, I did too, by the way. So. I just uh, that was that, that was an easy one. I wanted <laughs> to give it to Aaron Cepos only because nobody paid attention because it didn't matter. But he was phenomenal in his NFL debut. But nobody yeah. cares about the punter. But Jalen Hurts did, you know. And I wanted to give part of it to Nick Sirianni as well because, you know, one coach, it, it was the hot candidate of this cycle, and it was the guy on the other side, and one coach had a guy who's made the Pro Bowl five times. And the other coach had a guy in his fifth start. And the other coach clowned the flavor of the month. There's no other way to explain it. He embarrassed them. Now, they have more talent, but that was pitiful from Atlanta's perspective. It was, and it was a beatdown of epic proportions when all was said and done. Yes, the Eagles got out a little slow. I tweeted out, the Eagles were very lucky to be up 7-6 after the Falcons' second possession because they were moving the ball up and down the field. I want to give Sirianni a lot of credit, too, but I want to make sure that Jonathan Gannon is not le left out of the credit mix as well. We do use this word all the time in the NFL, adjustments. Was it just that the Eagles needed to tweak a couple of things, John? Because the first couple of, of uh, possessions, if the Falcons didn't shoot themselves in the foot with some penalties, uh, the Eagles could have been behind the eight ball early. But damn, if they didn't shut the Falcons down from there on out, what did Gannon uh, tweak and or change that changed the defense from being porous to downright stonewall? Yeah, I, I don't know if he changed that much because he was he was he was being you know pretty multiple on the on the first couple drives as well. The Eagles just weren't tackling well. I think that was a big part of it, and they. You know, maybe that was uh, back to the preseason that we talk about not playing all that much. So I think they sharpened up as a little bit as the game went on. But then, you know, I, I think the circumstance of the game, once it becomes a two-score game, it's it changes everything, and you can load up on the run. Uh, and, you know, the most bizarre thing from Atlanta, uh, from the Falcons' perspective, was that first drive. I mean, the Eagles couldn't do anything thing with Calvin Ridley we talked about the running game but I think he was three or three on targets and then uh, I'm sitting there at halftime and I looked at a few of the writers and I'm like did Ridley get hurt did I miss it they just stopped <laughs> going to him so you see this a lot with coaches in this league they script 
you know, that's a little bit overblown, but if everything goes perfectly, they script the first 15 plays. And then once you get off that script, they just forget. And they, they, you know, I, I don't know how other, another way to describe it, but by the time he got back to it, uh, it, the game was over. Um, and yeah, I mean, the Eagles did, as I said, you know, there were two teams in the NFL, and Jody, you know this, last year that didn't score 30 points, and it was the Jets and the Eagles. Um, game one, over 30 points. Jonathan Gannon, I- I'll tell you what, if you average 260 yards or whatever it does, is on defense, you're going to have the number one ranked defense in the NFL. And if you give up six points in a game, you're going to have the number one ranked scoring defense. So. I don't know how it could have went better. Maybe New Orleans, that type of atmosphere. But other than the Saints, I mean, they were arguably the most impressive team in week one. John, one thing I noticed in this game, I thought Kyle Pitts was going to become a huge problem for them. What did Jonathan Gannon do after those first two series? Because he was pretty much just a non-factor at that point. Yeah, I mean, I I think part of that was – it just, I talk about rookies all the time. You got it. I mean, as talented as you are, you got to get used to it. And, and he seemed a little bit uh, overwhelmed, at least early. I'm not sure it was the Eagles as much as uh, Kyle just had a difficult time in his first NFL game. And he's not the first. Um, and Devontae Smith on the other side of the coin was just fine. So that was a big positive for the Eagles as well. I, I just think he looked a little bit, uh, I don't want to say nervous. I don't know what word you want to use, but I just think he was out of sorts more than anything else. And, I, I, you know, the one thing I got right is that I said I didn't like the spot. I picked the Falcons in the game. Uh, but I did say Pitts probably won't be what he is later in the season, uh, and he wasn't. And, and hopefully for the Falcons uh, – he can settle down, but yeah, he did. He did not play well. wasn't really a factor at all. And let me come to the defense of one of the Eagles, who, as you mentioned, John, you really got to nitpick to find things wrong with the Eagles. But everybody does, and all their columns have the winners and losers after the game. And this guy got a couple of loser votes, um, and that was Avante Maddox. I think he got pits on most coverages all day long. All right, yeah, he missed a couple tackles. I'm uh, not, not going to look past that. Uh, so that's why he ended up on the loser column. But if Pitts didn't make plays, yeah, you can write it off to he looked like a rookie or the coverage wasn't that bad. And Avante Maddox has given up about a foot and a half to Pitts. I actually thought Avante Maddox did not play badly yesterday, although he did come under a couple of media critics' eye as a guy who didn't have the best of games. I, I, I would give him a passing grade for his first effort and give him some credit for keeping Pitts under wraps. Yeah, I mean, well, that's part of that. I was one of those that pointed out Avante because of the tackling issues, it, it, but it is nitpicking. You got to find something if you're trying. I, I mean, I probably should have thrown Eric Wilson in there as well, at least early. Um, and that's just one I would put a little asterisk next to, especially with San Francisco coming in this week, because the one thing I come out of this game questioning is the Eagles uh, run defense and really more of the linebackers than anything else. Um, and, you know, San Francisco is known for years. I mean, they have the most complicated rushing scheme in the NFL. They have one of the best. Kyle Shanahan does it probably better than anybody else. So that's going to be a big test. So just put an early note on that. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, Avante, the Eagles were going to throw a bunch of different looks at Kyle Pitts, and they did. Um, and Avante is part of it. And it's not that he played poorly. It, it, to me, it's a little bit disappointing because he's such a good athlete, especially when he's in open, uh, in open field tackles. I think he should do a better job. But hopefully that's just the preseason. The September is the new August, blah, blah, blah. Hopefully – you know, as they ramp up to it in a couple of weeks, uh, that gets cleaned up a little bit. John, switching to the offensive side of the ball, we want to talk about rookies. I thought Devonta Smith had a tremendous debut for a player making, 
uh, his first career start. Um, Matched to Sean Jackson's record for catches. He's the only player in Eagles franchise history that five catches and a touchdown in his debut. What was your, what were your thoughts on Devonta Smith's performance? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought he was great. I, I thought Nick's game plan was great. I thought, you know, he got the football. He made things easy, easy for Jalen Hurts. Uh, I thought it was a perfect example of taking advantage of the strengths uh, of the players you have. Um, he's brought a college offense to the pro level. And I always tell Jody, it's, it's, it's not trickle down in this industry. It's trickle up. Um, and he, that's, he looked at Jalen Hurts and Devontae Smith and Jalen Rager and, and Quez Watkins and said, okay, what do these guys do well? And he went back to the college team, and that's what he's doing. And from Hurts' perspective, you know, that was probably uh, one of the deepest throws he had in the game was the touchdown pass other than um, the Zach Hurts play, which is a little bit underthrown, to be honest. Um, and, you know, Devontae won off the line of scrimmage, and it was a great throw. But you can sense the confidence growing because of the, the quick hitches, the, the bubble screens to start the game, the just getting them a rhythm. And we talked all offseason, 52%, 52%, 52%. Week one, 77%. Now, I, I, it's not like Jalen is, again, throwing it 25 yards down the field. But you can see how it, it, it breeds confidence. Those quick, easy completions. And then when you got to throw it down the field, you just feel better about yourself. Yes. I can't say enough good things about Nick Sirianni this morning. I want to say bad things, but I can't. <laughs> Sirianni and Hurts, they go hand in hand, of course. And uh, the thing that impressed me the most uh, about Sirianni was the drive at the end of the first half. A perfect test. You get the ball back, less than two minutes to go. You've got your timeouts. You got 70 yards to go. Can you stick the ball in the end? Can you at least get a field goal? No, they got it all the way down, stuck the ball in the end. Even after losing a touchdown on that Lane Johnson downfield penalty, which was accurate, they gave you a great replay on it. Lane just yeah, kind of got caught to yeah. have to score twice to get the points before half. It's the quarterback, it's the coach, it's the play calling, it's the time management, which we like to second guess a lot here in town. He checked every single box the, between the two of them. They both did with that touchdown before the half, and I felt very good going out for my halftime cigarettes and, damn, the birds look good. Yeah, they did. Uh, and, and then the second half was just uh, complete domination. But that was really, you know, once they extended the lead, um from seven, six, and that was the touchdown, you know, that, that really, I, I mean, Atlanta was dead in the water at that point, whether we knew it uh, or not. And then they got, obviously, uh, because of the penalty, they got the, the two point conversion as well. So that was a, a smart decision to go for that. Um, once, once that happened, I, I don't know, you guys probably saw it better than me. It looked like Dallas, that ball might've hit the turf. I don't know, but, um, uh, couldn't it tell from yeah, the replay from the replay yeah, couldn't tell. tell it may have but you couldn't see it yeah. so they called it a touchdown yeah, so they, they couldn't overturn, overturn it. it you know that's one where it's good you're not the sunday night game so you're taking advantage you don't have as many angles but um hey uh, it, it it worked out for them and uh it it ended up being a great drive i think it was 12 plays so it wasn't just the last play and that was that was a tight window throw uh one where maybe he said, eh, maybe don't try to fit that in there. And it ended up working well. So, uh, yeah, everything came up roses for this team. Um, and, and, and now we're going to see, um, and Jalen Hurts talks about this a lot because, you know, when he goes back, he always talks about rat poison. He goes back to Alabama with Nick Saban. And he always points out, people assume that's negative stuff. In Alabama, it's positive stuff as well, because everybody's telling those guys how great they are all the time, how, you know, how they beat up on everybody every week, which is true. And, and Saban tells them, you know, don't listen to that either. Because if, if the Eagles are going to listen to all the accolades and how great they are, you know, they're not going to be ready for San Francisco. So it's another impressive thing about the quarterback is – 
same guy after after a big blowout win, 77%, everything great, same guy. John, that throw from Jalen Hurts to Dallas Goddard, I thought – Outside of Patrick Mahomes, that was the second best throw by any quarterback in the league yesterday. Was that the best throw Jalen Hurts has ever made? Uh, it might be. Uh, you know, it's it, it kind of – because I think the most – see, I look at it in a different way, Jeff, because I think the most impressive part of all the statistics and Jalen Hurts and third guy, you know, that crazy number you see going around, third guy in history – 250 yards, 70 plus percent, three touchdowns, no interceptions, 60 yards rushing. I mean, I don't care about that other than to say there's not a lot of guys that can do that if they're clicking on all cylinders. So that's more important to me. But I, I think the one thing about Jalen Hurts that was the best of all was his decision making. So I, 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 I look at it different. Was that the best decision? It worked, but do you want to try to? fit that football in there sometimes it's not going to work so it depends how you look at it if you want to i'm trying to nitpick and come up with some negatives that's okay <laughs> you don't have to do that john if we're pushing you to that uh, we're not trying but um here's what i liked about Jalen's decision making yesterday and he did something that is going to be part of his success in the nfl if he's going to be a successful nfl quarterback and damn he sure looked like one yesterday he makes plays with his legs. Some are scripted on RPOs and other improvised when he drops back into the pocket and it's not there. What I liked yesterday was he did most of his running down the sidelines. And, John, you and I talk enough about Jalen, the fact that he's a uh, power lifter and he looks more like a fullback than a scat back if he's doing his running. And you'd be tempted when you've got that kind of strength to drop a shoulder and turn it upfield and get the extra yard. Yesterday, he scampered out of bounds a couple times, and he said, I'm going to get what I'm going to get, but I'm not going to get touched, and that's what you need to have with your quarterback because you need him on the field. People worry about Devonta Smith because of his, because of his frame. I worry more about Jalen Hurts because of his frame because I fear he might try and get those extra yards and end up hurting himself. Didn't yesterday, took what he could get down the sidelines and then got the hell out of bounds. I thought that was a, a very important part of Jalen's very successful yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. and I, you know, that's part of that decision making. Even, uh, you know, the the fourth down, they didn't convert where he was kind of flush and right and, and, and realized at the last minute, uh, well, this is going nowhere, but I'm not going to lose 10, whatever it would have been, 10, 15 yards on top of it. Uh, and threw it uh, out of bounds at the last second. I, it's always, it's always fun when you see a young quarterback, you know, making the right decisions because that's when you get in trouble when you make bad decisions. You didn't see a lot of bad decisions from Jalen Hurts yesterday, and that, to me, is the most, again, the most impressive part of the entire performance. John. One matchup I was really excited to see was the Eagles defensive line versus the Falcons offensive line. And boy, did uh, Eagles defensive line put a hurting on Matt Ryan that second half. Yeah, the second half, the, the Sharks were circling. I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't do anything. And once you take off, you know, once you take the running game out of it, um, yeah, that especially that interior uh, wasn't going to hold up. And it was interesting. I mean, Javon Hargrave, I talked about it all summer, had a great, great summer in training camp. Uh, and he got two sacks, and Hassan Ridgeway got the other sack. Wasn't the guys you would expect, but, yeah, when they dominate, and that's, you know, guys, quarterbacks hate the pass rush up the middle. I mean, they hate any pass rush, but when it comes right in their face, that's when they really, really get uncomfortable. You know, that's how Tom Brady lost two Super Bowls to the Giants. Uh, he only lost three. He lost the, the other two because of the pressure up the middle, period. That's how the Giants beat him. Um, it, it, it's probably the most important aspect to stopping a, a good quarterback. And, yeah, the Eagles made Matt Ryan very, very uncomfortable in that second half. I don't know what it is about the power. And so when they get in the red zone, they can't score. They change coaches. Julio Jones isn't there. They can't score in the red zone. It's amazing. 
yesterday they took a couple of ill opportune penalties. And that's another thing to give the Eagles credit for. Eagles took their fair share of penalties too. They overcame them. The Falcons did not. Whenever they take a penalty, they'd end up paying for it, not be able to convert on third down, have to settle for field goals or punt the ball away. Uh, one other note on the defensive line for me. I know he didn't get a sack, and yes, that's what defensive ends are supposed to do, get sacks. But I thought Josh Sweat played a heck of a game yesterday. He was, for large stages of the game, the Eagles' best tackler. Uh, early on when the Falcons were moving the ball, both the linebackers and the uh, secondary weren't doing a great job tackling. Josh Sweat was. I thought he played great throughout the game. He got slightly more snaps than Derek Barnett did. I think there's a differentiation between the two. I think Sweat has certainly proved he's the better of the two if they're going to be shuttling back and forth. You think Gannon will just keep it as is, pretty much a 50-50 split going forward? I, yeah, I, I mean, you want to rotate those guys. And I think um, – now, you don't know. The snap, canes, snap counts came out this morning. So, you know, it's a blowout so late probably affected it uh, a little bit and and uh, I'll have to go over the film to see how it shook out but if you look even Ryan Kerrigan it was it was so if you look at the defensive ends I'm just uh, looking at it I think sweat sweat led with 39 Graham 36 Kerrigan 34 Barnett 33 I mean that that's, that's as even as you get I think part of that though was you know, it wasn't a close game at the end. I think I think the test is going to be when you're in a one-score game, who's out there in the end. When you need to stop, who's out there? And then we'll know uh, who who JG is going to lean on. I I don't I don't know when you look at these snap counts today. I don't know how much you can take from them because of the the circumstance of the second half. John, uh, Quez Watkins, I think it was, what, three three plays, three targets, three catches, and then he kind of, I don't want to say he disappeared, but was, was that more of J.J. Ortega-Whiteside just taking his snaps at 11 personnel because he was blocking so well? Yeah, I think it was funny. We're all, J.J. started, and we're all going, what the heck is going on here? And then we see it's a bubble screen, and J.J. can block, which is, you know, he can block, and you know, it's not what you want of your second round pick a couple of years ago, but that's where they are with JJ. Uh, but it, it's just another example of Nick Sirianni taking advantage of what he has. And that's what JJ does well. So let's, let's let him block. Um, and we'll see. I mean, you know, Nick talked all off season, all summer about, he thought he would have a competitive advantage early in the season. Turns out he did. But now, now it's on film. So we're going to see, you know, how quickly to do opposing defenses adjust. If they see J.J. on the field, are they going to know bubble screen? You know, if you see 19. So you have to – that's that's the test. Like, what is Nick Sirianni going to do when people know, okay, this is what's coming? Uh, and that's going to be the interesting part of it. Speaking of blocks on a bubble screen, Ooh, yeah. Jordan Mailata against yeah. a defensive back is just not fair. That's not fair. That was as big a crushing blow as you saw in the National Football League. All 15 games combined over the weekend, uh, that was just uh, scary good. A well-called, designed, and then executed play by Jordan Mailata, who got paid over the weekend. Johnny Mack, you and I talked about it all year leading up to uh, game number one about Howie Roseman always likes to find one guy that he targets and signals out as the eagle of the future and get a deal done before the season gets underway to lock that guy up. He hadn't done it till yesterday, till whatever, Saturday, and he did it with Jordan Mailata. And I know they were ribbing him pretty good in the locker room about uh, Mr. Money because he got <laughs> his contract done. Um, he, he answered the bell here in week number one. Uh, I was surprised that it uh, went right up until right before the first game started. They picked the right guy to extend? Well, it is their, you know, organizational philosophy. We talk about it a lot. I mean, they just value the offensive line, defensive line uh, more than, say, tight end. So when we look at Mylotta, uh versus Dallas Goddard for interest, uh, in, uh, um, 
as an indication. I mean, it, it makes sense that they defaulted to the offensive line first, but I, I think they wanted to get a deal done with Dallas Goddard. So I don't necessarily think it's only that. I think Dallas knows he can kind of cash in uh, if he has a, a decent season. It's, I'm just guessing, but his agents are probably telling him to bet on himself. Um and Jordan, for as you know, as big as it looks, I mean, that's going to be that's going to be a bargain. Uh, people don't understand. I mean, that is a team friendly deal. So, if the Eagles could have gotten a team friendly deal done with Dallas Goddard, I think that would happen as well. And then it's going to be interesting to see uh, Sweat versus Barnett. You know, can you sign both of them? I would think they want to sign Sweat. Uh, but you have some injury concerns in there that complicates it a little bit more um, because of what happened to him in, in high school. Um, so, uh, but anytime they have good offensive linemen, good defensive linemen, I always think about when Jordan has those highlight blocks because he's got these. I always think about Jeff Stoutland because you know that's those are the types of blocks that have our our buddies, you know, Ross Tuck. And, and Baldy putting Jordan in the Hall of Fame, and he, he has the he has the best highlight blocks. And then you go back to Jeff Stoutland, who's so gruff, and he's like, "Just got to be more consistent." And he's always, and that's why that's why they turns out you know these great offensive linemen because you know to him it's about play to play. It's not about right. highlights. Uh, so John, now I gotta ask you, what happens to Andre Dillard? I, I, I'm not talking about like this year, but you know, what do the Eagles do with this guy? Well, he's gonna have to change positions if he wants to stay here, uh, and I don't see that happening. So, I mean, I hey, he could trade it. You, Jeff, you and I talk about this a lot. I mean, there are so many teams who need offensive line help; they could spin him off in any minute. Certainly by the trade deadline. Uh, if somebody gets desperate uh, at some point for a tackle. Ultimately, I, I don't think he can change positions, so I don't think you're going to be talking about him moving the right tackle as the heir apparent to Lane Johnson, and Lane's still playing at a high level. So, yeah, I, I, I think it's just a matter of time now, and, you know, when can the Eagles trade him? All right, uh, I want to ask you about a guy who, kind of like Andre Dillard, got limited snaps yesterday. Andre on special teams was five. Austin Scott got 12 snaps all on special teams, not one from the line of scrimmage. Uh, we thought it was going to be a three-man backfield for week one. It was a two-man backfield. Uh, Austin Scott did not get in and get one snap. What are we reading to that, Jay Mack? Uh, just that Kenny Gainwell is a, a proven to them that uh, he should be the second guy and he's going to play a lot and he's going to play when Miles doesn't. And really, I think it was the Jets joint practices um, where they really uh, tested him uh, against the Jets and they put him essentially as the third down back in the in the back in the hurry up and, and the high leverage situations as a pass catcher when he got to throw the football. Uh, and I think they were trying to figure out, okay, can, is he ready as a rookie to do this immediately? And they came to the conclusion he was, and he certainly played well yesterday. So it's not going to change in the foreseeable future unless, obviously, one of them can't play. Uh, but they still like Boston. It's just that they were ultimately going that direction. Kenny Gainwell, that's why they got him here. And the question is, when could they get there? They thought it was week one, and he played well in week one. Another thing that worked out. So, John, I, I have to ask you this, too, about the injuries. Uh, Zach Ertz looked like – I think he came back in yesterday. wasn't 100% sure, and uh, Marcus Epps. Yeah, Zach did come back in, so it was a hamstring. And that's – you know, people are probably going to look at that. I don't know how that affected – Dallas played a little bit more than Zach, and they were about 60-40. Uh, 11 versus 12, which makes sense right about where they typically are. Um, but I don't know how much uh, that affected things. Uh, yeah, Marcus went out early uh, with the concussion, and he was he was he was the starter. Uh, he was going to play the majority of the time uh, on defense, and I think eight eight snaps or so he got a concussion and came on. Came in and 
held down the fort and it was just fine. I mean, they give up, you know, the Falcons weren't able to take advantage of it. So I, you know, you never want somebody to go down, but I, I think anytime you have a performance like that as a defense as a whole gives everybody confidence. John, did uh, anyone after the game say Rodney McLeod's status? No, he wasn't up for the game, and we debated all week as to whether he was going to play or not. We sur surely thought he's going to make the first two games because if he's only coming back for one and you could have put him on short-term IR if he missed three. Um, so the uh, signs kind of point to next week. Anyone give further confirmation on that? They kind of need him now with the Epsom injury. Yeah, no, not uh, yeah, that's not typically an after the game question because they ruled him out Friday. So we'll, we'll get into Rodney's status on Wednesday. I mean, he's going to continue to practice. The question is, um, hey, you're right. I mean, by what they did, the indication of what they did, they think he's going to be back um, before the first six games, not necessarily before the first three because – while you can, uh, you know, put somebody on injured reserve after you count them on the 53, remember, it would have to be a new injury. It can't be the same injury that you have to activate them off pup. So they couldn't have used the ACL excuse for the three-game short-term injured reserve. So really it means – John, Johnny, you know we can all get around that, right? Well, yeah, they could do But it, they, they are a little bit tougher – on those types of shenanigans now. So I, I do think it's legitimate. So I think that the real, uh, my only point is the real uh, the bar is the fifth game more than the, the second game. John. Or it actually would be the fourth game. I'm getting in the weeds now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, yesterday I tweeted, this, this is the big play slay. The Eagles paid for. I thought he was good last year, but I didn't think he was Darius' big play slay. Was yesterday his best game as an Eagle? Yeah, I don't. I think Darius played pretty well last year. Like I'm a little bit easier on cornerbacks than most people. I'm usually harsher on people. It's so hard to play corner in this league. I don't think there are lockdown corners. So once you get that reputation, Stephon Gilmore's probably an example of this. He wins Defensive Player of the Year. Jalen Ramsey as well. He's the best corner in football. And then they just take nosedives and people say, what's going on with these guys? It's just impossible to play corner in the NFL. If, you have, if you're playing a good corner uh, quarterback and, you know, things are clicking for that particular team uh, on, on a game day, you know, what do you do? What do you do? Um, and, and, I, I thought he played well, and he, he himself said he had one and a half bad games. Um, Green Bay, and I forget the, the really bad one. You probably remember, Jeff, but, oh, the DK Metcalf game. Yeah, yeah. well, that was more yeah. DK than him. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's, he said he didn't play well against DK. He admitted that, and, and then a half against Green Bay. He thought he didn't play well. I thought he was the best corner the Eagles have had in years last year. So I think people were too harsh on him. He's just a good player, but he's going to get beat this year. So people don't think he's going to get beat. It's, it's the NFL. And when Mahomes is here, Brady is here, he's going to get beat. I mean, get used to it. It happens. It happens to every corner in this league. All right. My turn to nitpick. Um, I'm not sure Darius Slate could tackle me. I know he could cover me, and he did a nice yeah, job in tackle. coverage yesterday, yeah. but if there's anybody in the NFL that reminds me of Deion Sanders, great at coverage, can't tackle uh, air, it would be Darius Slay because he missed a couple badly yesterday early on. Um, yeah, so. that's kind of baked in with Darius. It's interesting because he thinks he's a great tackler. He doesn't know what people are talking about when they ask him about tackling. I guess it's part of the confidence. Yeah, it, you got to be confident to play corner in the NFL. So he thinks he's a great tackler, but yeah, he's not. He's never yeah. been a great tackler. No, even, no. <laughs> even I bet he sure. thinks. He thinks. Yeah, he can think whatever he wants. And my other nitpick, John, before we let you run, uh, love the fact that Nick Sirianni picked up where Doug Peterson left off, aggressively going for it on fourth down. That's Did it twice yesterday. Yeah. They didn't. Gain, um, gain well between the tackles on fourth and two. 
Really? I love his aggressiveness, but his first call didn't not only didn't it excite me, it left me scratching my head. I guess he thought no one expected it, but the Falcons yeah, were up to the challenge. Uh, he's got to get Doug's old playbook back uh, out for fourth down conversions. Yeah, that's I think he was trying to surprise him on the on the game well run. That's you know, it, it's a hit myth. I actually my nitpick on the fourth down was he got the plays in too late. So maybe that was the one rookie hiccup. It seemed like they were rushing. They were getting into place too late early, uh, and they were rushing to the line of scrimmage, and maybe that kind of wonkied up what they were trying to execute. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I think it's positive that he went for it. Uh, but, yeah, when you don't get it, it doesn't look positive. But you talk to all the analytics people, and that's what you should do, and blah, blah, blah. So. It's it's nice that he uh, um, he did it, and it didn't really hurt the Eagles. So, uh, yeah, we'll be nitpicking that in the future. If it doesn't work and it hurts. Didn't hurt him at all yesterday. Jalen Hurts was the only Hurts that mattered yesterday for the Philadelphia Eagles. J-Mac, safe trip home. Uh, we'll get you back here tomorrow, brother. All right. Thanks, guys. John McMullen, usual co-host of Birds 365, went down to cover the game in Atlanta, flying back today, so he hops on as a guest to start the show, and we got Jeff Curran instead. Jeff and I will come back, continue to break down the Eagles' impressive opening game victory over the Falcons here next on Birds 365. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home, available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify.